to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the Mighty Kraken, the best place to buy and sell Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I've got part eight of my Beginner's Guide to Bitcoin, an interview with Jerry Brito and Peter Van Valkenburg from Coin Center, looking into how all this Bitcoin stuff is legal. But before that, I do have a message from my amazing show sponsors. So first up, today's show is brought to you by Dropbit, the only mobile wallet I use for sending and receiving Bitcoin. And when I head out to South America next month, I will be taking it with me. I'll be loading up my wallet with sats for when I'm out and about and when I need a little Bitcoin. I also cut up with the team today discussing their plans for 2020. Some very, very cool things coming. Can't wait to tell you all about that. But why do I love the Dropbit wallet? Well, it just is the easiest way to send and receive Bitcoin. It is like a Venmo for Bitcoin. And they've added so many cool things. Yes, you can send it to an address. You can send it to a QR code. We all expect that, right? But you can also tweet Bitcoin to your friends. You can send Bitcoin to your friends. You can do it over Lightning. They've done this very cool implementation of the Lightning Network. And you can also buy Bitcoin directly from within the app. If you haven't downloaded Dropbit, seriously, what are you doing with your life? It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just head over to dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. Also, today's show is brought to you by Kelman Law the only law firm I would use if I get myself into some Bitcoin bullshit. If I need some help or some advice, these are the guys I'm going to be talking to. They are Bitcoin OGs. They're based out in New York. And unlike other crypto lawyers, these guys understand both Bitcoin and fintech. And guess what? You can pay for them in Bitcoin. You can pay for your services with Kelman Law using Bitcoin. Pretty cool, right? One of the partners, Zachary Kelman, is known for drafting a bill submitted to U.S. Congress in 2014 aimed at exempting on-chain Bitcoin transactions from U.S. regulations. The other founding partner, Daniel Kelman, was on my show as part of my Mount Got series, helping me understand the complexities around civil rehabilitation. So listen, if you operate in a fintech business or have a dispute with someone involved in Bitcoin, maybe someone owes you some Bitcoin, or you just need some legal advice related to Bitcoin or fintech, Open up your email and send a message to info at kelman.law. That's K-E-L-M-A-N.law. Kelman with one L, not two. Or just head over to their website, which is www.kelman.law. Okay, so now onto the show, rattling through this beginner's guide. We're over halfway through, and now we understand what Bitcoin is, how it came to exist, what are all the technologies that make it happen. It's time to dive into the regulations which cover Bitcoin. And a big warning first. Regulations will always be jurisdiction specific. So my audience is mainly US based and the US tends to lead regulation. People tend to follow them. So I got on Jerry and Peter from Coin Center who are both based out of Washington, D.C. So the focus on this interview is US specific, is based around US regulations. But the categories of things we're discussing probably exist within every market. So make sure if you're not US based and you're thinking about one of the topics we discussed today that you check out your local regulations. Also, it gets pretty complicated at times. I'm not going to lie. This is one of the most complicated shows so far. It's just the legal stuff. It's all the bullshit legal stuff that we have to deal with. So I'm sorry. We get into some tricky subjects. We cover some tricky things. But listen, there's stuff in the show notes to help you, and you can always flip up Google, search for some of these topics if you want to find out more. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the show. If you've got any questions, do reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Jerry, Peter, how are you? Very good. Thanks for having us. Great. Thanks. First time to get Jerry on. Peter, you've been on a couple of times, but great to have you both on. So I've been running this Beginner's Guide to Bitcoin I've done seven recordings now. I've covered the prehistory of Bitcoin, why it's important, what it is. We've gone up the technical detail. But now we're going to cover how is this all legal, which actually was an idea from Niraj. So we have to say a big thanks to Niraj. But we're going to cover why this is this is all legal. But like for people who don't know who Coin Center are, I think as a good tee up, it'd be just very useful to understand who you are and what it is the work that you guys do. Well, thanks for that. So Coin Center is an independent nonprofit based in D.C., and we're focused on the public policy issues that affect cryptocurrencies and open blockchain networks, so things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the like, right? So these are open, permissionless networks. They are unowned by anybody. And so as a result, there's a bit of a collective action problem uh, where who's going to stand up for these networks that nobody owns? And so that's what we are. We're sort of self-appointed lobbyists and advocates for 
these networks when it comes to policymaking. So an easy way to think about it is if you're familiar with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, what the EFF is to the open internet, we aspire to be to open blockchain networks. Okay, great. All right. So one of the complications of this show that we don't have with other shows is that legislation will be jurisdiction specific. So I've been out to Bolivia recently, found out that Bitcoin isn't legal there when I was there. We know it's certain uses of it is illegal in China. We also know the likes of Estonia and Malta is quite open-minded. So I think we need to just set the position for anyone listening to begin with. We're going to base this on the US and we're going to base it on the key uh, areas that you guys look into, the key areas of policy and legislation. But if anyone is based out of the US, they really need to do the research in their own country. Is that a fair starting point? I think it's absolutely right. I mean, it's regulation like all laws, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, even though the U.S. Um, has a habit of being extraterritorial in nature, which means that the, the long arm of the law in the U.S. extends globally sometimes. Yeah, so it's not a bad idea to get an idea of what U.S. laws are, even if you don't think you're subject to them, because surprise, you never know when you are. <laughs> Okay, and just another note on this is that it is a Bitcoin show, and usually I don't ever cover altcoins, but I think it might be difficult to to talk about this show and not talk in reference to some altcoins with regards to specific things. For example, when we get into the area of security. So that's absolutely fine if you feel like you need to refer to altcoins in explanation of any area. Okay, so... And, And Peter, so on the altcoin subject, you know, Coin Center's work is generally coin agnostic. Most of the work we do is on Bitcoin. But from a regulatory policy standpoint, it doesn't matter as much as you might think because regulation, when it's good, and most of the time, is activities-based. So it's about what you're doing. It's not about the technology you're doing it with. So if you're moving money using Bitcoin versus Litecoin, for example, the same laws are going to apply. Okay, great. Okay, so quite a broad first question to kick off with, but... What classes of regulation does Bitcoin fall under? So, you know, as Peter was just saying, it's not Bitcoin itself that falls under regulation, the U.S. anyway. Bitcoin itself is not regulated. It is activities that you might perform with Bitcoin uh, that are going to be the regulated activities. And we think about four main areas of law that we sort of focus on. And those are investor protection, consumer protection, anti-money laundering, and tax. Those are kind of the four big, broad areas. Yeah, and so the corresponding activities there, uh, for investor protection, the activity that's regulated is usually raising money, hence the question about pre-sales or about uh, secondary markets where people trade Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Uh, the area of consumer protection, the activity that might be regulated would be a company that helps you move money using cryptocurrency, like a money transmitter would. And so that's like when Coinbase or somebody else holds your Bitcoin for you. And then, you know, tax is tax. Tax. If you make money, that's an activity. You've made money. You might get taxed. You're, you're probably going to get taxed. <laughs> and then the last is anti-money laundering, which, yeah. again, th- that tends to apply uh, to people who are engaged in what Peter said before, which is the transmission of, of funds. or Yeah. Maybe especially in the cross-border context right. or things like that, though. And I guess it depending on whether you are just a regular retail user who's buying and holding or using Bitcoin – the things you need to be aware of are going to be have to be slightly different for whether you're running some kind of business, whether that's an exchange or a wallet. There's different considerations. Exactly. And we'll probably get into this later, but one of Coin Center's big focuses is making sure that regulators understand the difference between someone who, say, runs a node on a network and doesn't actually hold other people's Bitcoins, they just help the network run, versus a custodian who holds other people's Bitcoins and therefore puts them at risk and is more reasonably a target for regulation, unlike the guy who's just running a node, who shouldn't be regulated. And what are the various regulatory bodies that you have to work with, uh, liaise with, uh, based out there in the U.S.? Yeah, so, I mean, you obviously have legislative bodies like Congress um, at the national level and different state legislatures. But then going down the line and thinking through those broad areas, Treasury is uh, – the Treasury Department here in the U.S. is a big one because Treasury houses both the IRS for tax policy but also houses FinCEN, which is the 
what's called the Financial Intelligence Unit, which basically administers the anti-money laundering laws. Then on on, um, investor protection, that is going to be the SEC and the CFTC. On the SEC, it's going to be for securities regulations, obviously. And on the CFTC side, it's going to be for derivatives regulation and uh, potentially uh, also for just market regulation of commodities markets, spot markets. So that could be just Bitcoin trading. Yeah. So for example, if you have questions about is the price of Bitcoin being manipulated and things like that on various exchanges, that's something that in the U.S. the CFTC might look into. And then what am I missing? Uh, in, uh, consumer protection, that's mostly done on a state-by-state basis. So that would be either the state banking or money transmission authorities. Uh, but then you also have federal legislation there as well. So you've got the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You have the OCC and, and you know, there are more. <laughs> it quickly gets to be an alphabet soup. Yeah. So you're, especially your non-U.S. listeners are probably tuning out now. <laughs> But these things are, of yeah. course, relevant because yeah. there's usually a counterpart agency in, in, in any EU member state, in most you know, East Asian nations, all around the world. There's usually something similar, although usually there's fewer of them per country, whereas in the U.S. we've got an odd number, uh, an oddly large number of regulators who all have jurisdiction. Well, so like my other shows, I just did one on monetary policy, and then previous to that, I covered the Bitcoin protocol, technically how it works. And my advice to everyone in every one of those episodes is, look, this might be a bit complicated. It might go over your head a bit. You know, just bear with it. If you've got any further questions, go into the show notes, get into Google. You know, you, there is further information out there if you need it. I mean, I will be linking to the Coin Center website so they can find out more information. So I would say to them, just bear with it. Also, it depends on someone's experience. You know, this might be somebody who's a complete beginner who's never even bought Bitcoin or it might be somebody who's, you know, got a little bit of experience. We've got a wide range of people potentially listening to this. But one of the things they might not realize when they first get into Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is both a currency and a protocol. Do you have to consider them both separately with the work you do? Yeah, absolutely. So as we were saying, regulation is always activities based. And when you think of Bitcoin as a currency, you're talking about people who might be performing activities that that move money, that do payments, that do store of value, the things that we would use a currency for traditionally. And those regulations then are going to be focused on things like anti-money laundering, for example, because if it's a currency, people are going to use it, or a currency substitute, as FinCEN, the anti-money laundering regulator, used to, uses the term. They're going to use it to move money. And maybe that means violation of sanctions. Maybe that means support for crime. Maybe that means any number of things. And so at that point, FinCEN takes an interest. Now, the, the question of Bitcoin as a protocol, yes, it's true that Bitcoin, the protocol is helping to move the money uh, at some level, but it's doing it in an information technology way. And so just to give one example, even before Bitcoin, FinCEN would make a distinction between a money transmitter like Western Union and a telecommunications provider like AT&T, and they'd say, look, AT&T might be the, the backbone of the telecommunications infrastructure that Western Union is using to move money, but AT&T is not a money transmitter. It's a facts and circumstances limitation to the money transmitter definition that if all you're doing is providing information throughput, you're definitely not a money transmitter. And we need to make the same arguments, and we've been very successful over the last five years making the same arguments about someone running a node on the Bitcoin network. That Bitcoin, the... Bitcoin as protocol is not a regulated thing, whereas Bitcoin as currency, depending on whether you're using it to move money around, might be regulated. And it's also um, further than that. It's not just that um, the Bitcoin protocol is unregulated, is that it must be unregulated in the U.S. anyway, uh, because in the U.S. we have the First Amendment, and the First Amendment protects freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and we haven't had to make these arguments, even though we've Prepared. prepared to make these arguments, but... Um, certainly developing open source software that uh, you know, makes up the Bitcoin protocol and running the software that basically listens for and, and, and repeats transactions is all speech. Yeah. Even publishing a block, if you were a successful miner, there's a good argument that that's just a speech activity. And so not only is it unregulated, it would be basically very, very difficult for the government to overcome the barriers uh, that it would have to in order to, to regulate it. 
And does blockchain itself, as it, which we know has become a marketing term for uh, protocols, but does blockchain itself have any consideration under regulation? Is it governed by anything, or is it something that is still just a marketing term? So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a marketing term, as you say, but look, to the extent you want to think about blockchains as basically databases, there's really no, re- again, there's no regulation of databases, but it's to what use do you put? Uh, these databases. So let's say that you are the New York Stock Exchange and you decide you're going to move away from whatever your infrastructure is today and you're going to move over to using a blockchain. I imagine that the SEC and whoever else in FINRA and whoever else your supervisors are, are going to want to be involved in that process. But that's not so much about the technology, it's about what you're doing with it. Yeah. It's more like there's a regulated institution, which might be, say, the New York Stock Exchange, And then they just need to convince their regulator that they can use certain software vendors or protocols for their back end. But that's much different than the back end being the regulated entity. And then there's two other things I want to ask you about before we get into the detail. So something that's come up regularly, even though this is a Bitcoin show, but something relevant to Bitcoiners and, you know, as like a complementary tool is stable coins, specifically Tether. And more recently, we are starting to hear a lot more about central bank-issued digital currencies. Where do these fit into the whole picture? Are they is Tether considered just like Bitcoin, or is it different? And where do the central banking, the central bank digital currencies come in? So those are two very different things. Let's take them one in turn. So stable coins, um, as Tether is, and as others traditionally are, it's a company that takes custody of consumer funds and issues you a token. That token then travels freely on a uh, permissionless network, and it can always be redeemed for the dollar, let's say. uh, Usually from the issuer. From the issuer, right. So this is a kind of a um, a novel uh, product, and I'm not sure that there uh, has been previously a very clear way that these are regulated. And so what we've seen is different firms who are doing this pursuing different ways to comply with law. Some, for example, like Paxos and Gemini, have created New York trust companies, which are basically bank-like firms that, you know, basically through their charter are able to do this. Others, like USDC, have done it through money transmission. I'm not sure how Tether does it. I think they probably just don't try, just don't have customers in the U.S., right? And that brings up one um, big question about these Stable coins is that maybe it's regulated at the um, point where a customer deposits dollars and gets a stable coin, and maybe it's regulated at the point where somebody comes with a stable coin and retrieves dollars. But in between, I'm not sure what the law that uh, uh, would apply would be. Yeah, and this is a hard question. So, you know, unfortunately, the stablecoin topics are extremely popular right now. So while Coin Center primarily exists to defend permissionless cryptocurrencies and really Bitcoin at the heart of it, we get a lot of questions about stablecoins because Facebook's launching one, China's talking about a, a government-run stablecoin potentially. And the consumer protection risks are completely different. And this is a point we often have to stress when we go into meetings on the Hill, for example. Libra... Uh, Facebook's proposed stablecoin would have a reserve that a company holds, and you have to trust them to hold that. Bitcoin, of course, there's no reserve that backs it. It's backed by people's trust in the stability of the number of the supply, which is something that's determined through the protocol, through math, and thus far effectively impossible to change. So we're usually at pains to make that distinction. Because the laws that apply are different, if you understand that distinction, and should be different. Because you don't have to worry in the same way you have to worry about a company keeping a reserve with Bitcoin. And just briefly on central bank digital currencies, the, the, you know, the one distinction, or one major distinction with a stable coin is that whereas with the case of Libra or Tether, there's a reserve of consumer funds that backs it. With central bank digital currencies, there's no such reserve. It's just that the issued coin is central bank money. And to me, the the thing that's interesting there is, look, I think that there are a lot of benefits, uh, certainly for central banks and potentially for consumers, to central bank digital currencies. But, you know, I I think they're kind of marginal. We already have, certainly in the uh, developed world, we already have digital money. 
digital dollars, right? So what advantage would you get from having it be tokenized? Um, I can imagine that the advantages that I would be interested in probably wouldn't exist in what ultimately is launched. It would probably be a much more tightly controlled, uh, tokenized you know, uh, a government currency. And so I guess I would have to wait and see that people, you know, people are very, I guess, on their edge of their seats about the Chinese digital yuan. You know, I, I think it's kind of crazy to, to be so excited about it until we see what the design is. I think once we see it, it, it we're going to be less uh, excited by it. Okay. Right. So let's get into the detail now. The first area we're going to cover is payments. But as we go through these different classes of regulation and different areas of regulation, it would be good to just start out by explaining who it impacts, you know, and how it impacts them differently. If it is consumers or if it's businesses, and if it's both, how it affects them differently. So let's start with payments. Sure. So when you're thinking about payments, you're you're mostly thinking about uh, money transmission regulation. And so what that means is that if you are a company that as a business, um, you are taking custody of consumer funds in order to help consumers complete a transaction, whether that is sending money from point A to point B or helping a merchant um, accept funds from a consumer, you are going to be licensed, right? And again, as Peter was saying earlier, the reason for that licensing, the theory behind it is if you're holding consumer funds in custody, you are, even if it's for a moment, putting um, those consumers' money at risk because you could run away with the money, you could lose it, you could be hacked. And so what's required of you is A, a license. So you have to go and get permission to operate your business. And that permission is um, going to be dependent on a background check, making sure you're not a criminal. Um, you're going to have to post a bond uh, of some kind. You're going to have certain restrictions on what you can keep the funds that you've taken from your consumers, what those can be kept in, etc. So it's pretty straightforward. I think the biggest issue that the industry has faced is two things. Number one, in the U.S., this is a state-by-state regulation. So if you open an exchange, you've got 50-plus different regulators um, that you have to get a license from. So that's very onerous. And secondly, especially, you know, earlier on, five, six, seven years ago especially, was not, you know, these regulators had never heard of Bitcoin. And so they didn't know what to do with it. And some states what did what New York did and went the bit license route and created very, very onerous restrictions. Since then, I think we've gotten a pretty good settlement where you have to get a lot of licenses. But at this point, regulators understand um, what crypto firms are. Some states have basically said that you don't need um, a license at all, depending on what you're doing. Um, and so it's much more navigable. It's not perfect, and there are different efforts that we could spend a couple hours talking about to try to u- create a uniform law around this across the states, um, but that's basically where we are. And so me as a retail user, I don't have to consider anything related to regulations of sending Bitcoin to other people in terms of payments. You don't, except that you might want to be aware whether the, a company that you're using, like an exchange, is regulated. Maybe that's important to you. Now, you as a regular user of, say, the Lightning Network, right. which is you know important technology to make Bitcoin scale, uh, one of several solutions, but probably the most promising at the moment, there is a question here. Coin Center's mission is to make sure you don't, as, right. a, as a member of the Lightning Network, ever need to worry about this sort of payments licensing regulation. Because... You could see people maybe, and no one's trying to do this yet, but you could see people making the argument that an intermediary node on the Lightning Network is kind of like a a Coinbase or what have you. They temporarily have some control over the money as it moves through the Lightning Channel. But Coin Center thinks that that's the wrong legal analysis because a Lightning node can't unilaterally decide to redirect your funds to somebody else. They can only complete their part of the channel and if they try to redirect, they get penalized by the protocol, and they're simply not able to. So from Coin Center's analysis, they don't put consumers at risk like a Mt. Gox puts consumers at risk because they can't lose or run away with the money. And therefore, they shouldn't fit in to the state-by-state licensing requirements that normal payment providers are, are required to fit into. 
And that's good policy, because if you're not putting consumers at risk, you shouldn't need to get a license. And it's also essential to maintaining people's freedom to use these technologies, because if every Lightning node had to be regulated, the Lightning Network wouldn't have the throughput that it would need to actually deliver on promises like microtransactions and low-fee payments. But yeah, again, luckily, we're prepared for that argument if the day comes, but it's not um, ever been really made. And if somebody listening to this is new, they might be like, what are you on about here, Pete? We haven't covered this yet. So the Lightning Network, we're going to be covering soon. But, you know, Peter, you rightly also said that it's a way for Bitcoin to scale. What I think people don't realize is the technicals behind how it works in that if I'm on the Lightning Network and you're on the Lightning, Peter, and you're on the Lightning Network, Jerry, if I send money to you via Bitcoin on the standard protocol, it goes from me to you. But if on the Lightning Network, it might go via Peter. So in the traditional sense of uh, money transmitters, you c- that's why Peter could have been considered a money transmitter. But as you can't tr- control those funds, you're really just relaying the transaction. This is why that's right. it shouldn't require a license, which is great. Okay, so in terms of money transmissions, I understand this. This is somebody is risking my money. And I think in the traditional kind of fiat world, whether it's the banks or whether it's PayPal or Stripe, I understand why they might want money transmission licenses. And I imagine a lot of these businesses in many ways are similar. But what are, what, did the, what does Bitcoin do that's very different from these traditional fiat-based systems? And what challenges does that bring to the regulators? So the, the, the first answer I'd give you is it shouldn't give them right. any challenges. It's sort of like... Um, Money transmission regulation is not about money transmission. It's about custody and risk from custody. So the fact that the money, and I'm doing scare quotes right now, is Bitcoin money instead of dollar money shouldn't matter. The one question is the custody risk. So we wouldn't want different regulations to apply to someone who's risking your Bitcoin by holding it than we would for someone who's risking your dollars while holding it. We often say, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And so... The differences there are are slight in the context of a company that's holding Bitcoin. Yeah, and I'll I'll say that the challenge that regulators who have been so used to the legacy system um, that they have is thinking in terms outside of transmission, right? These things are called money transmission licenses. They're not called money custody licenses, even though it's really what they're trying to get at. And the reason is, is that before the invention of Bitcoin, the only way that you could transmit funds was by first custodying it. And so the invention of Bitcoin provides a way that people can transmit funds across space and time, you know, and help others do it without ever taking custody of it. And that just does not fit into the paradigm of uh, of the regulators have. And sometimes it doesn't fit into the law as it's written, right? There's some states where you look up the definition of money transmission and the definition literally is transmission of money by wire or other means. (laughs) And so technically that could cover Bitcoin. As, as a protocol. As a protocol, right, which, is, which would be very you know, problematic. But I think regulators have slowly been able to interpret those laws to make sense rather than not. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so like I think we can conclude this section by saying, you know, if you're just a regular user or buyer of Bitcoin, you don't really have to worry too much unless you want to just check that uh, the company that you're uh, using does have the licenses. Uh, there, there's one thing, though, <clears throat> um, very important, and, and maybe this gets – more to anti-money laundering. But if you are a user, um, but maybe you start using it more and more and you get into the habit of buying and selling a lot and maybe putting up advertisements that you are willing to... Help people buy Bitcoin or by selling it to them. You know, if you're really getting a lot of people onboarded onto the platform, then regulators who are um, interested in regulating the on-ramps and off-ramps to Bitcoin, because, uh, and and that's why Jerry said this might be more about anti-money laundering, it's like people want to get onto the Bitcoin network to do something illegal, then if you're you're becoming one of those on- and off-ramps because you're doing so much sale and buy volume and you're advertising that you'll help people get onto the the platform, then people might start thinking of you as a money transmitter. Right. Like, and that's so, a tricky area to watch out for. Absolutely. Right. And so we've seen this with, for example, people who use local Bitcoins. Uh, different regulators around the world will look at people who buy and sell local Bitcoins and say, hey, at this point, you're doing it as a business. And so what you're doing is actually money transmission. 
So something to watch out for. Right, okay, so we can separate it here. Just a regular user who's buying for themselves, they're absolutely fine. The only time they need to consider uh, consider uh, regulation around payments is with regards to whether they want to check the company they're using has the right licenses. But if somebody was regularly buying and selling on behalf of other people, you know, maybe use an exchange like local bitcoins. So for people who don't know, that's a little bit like a open market for buying and selling bitcoin. The local bitcoins provides a platform for buyers and sellers to come together. That's when you'd have to really think about it. But if you're a business or you're thinking of starting to set up a business and you might be involved in the uh, transmission of bitcoin from one person to the other, then you will possibly need the license. Next up, I talk to Pete and Jerry more about how the, all this Bitcoin stuff is legal. But before that, I have a message from my amazing sponsors. So first up, we do have the Mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. But why? Why do I go on about Kraken? Why do I love Kraken so much? Well, firstly, Kraken is the most secure exchange out there. They put the safeguarding of your funds and your privacy as their number one objective. I've interviewed their chief security officer, Nick Pococo, Definitely go and check that out. Find out how much they put into securing your assets. Also, they've got amazing account management. And if you're a high volume trader, they're going to really look after you. But on the trading front, they've got a suite of products that no one can touch. They have Kraken.com, which is the best to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. You can also supercharge your trades with up to 5x leverage. If you're one of those crazy traders out there, you can get up to the second pricing data with cryptocurrency indices powered by CF benchmarks. They've got next level trading with Bitcoin futures. Their OTC desk smashes it. They've got deeper liquidity and private and more personalized services there. They've got Crypto Watch, where you can access multiple markets across multiple exchanges at a glance. And at the end of last year, they launched Kraken Pro, a beautiful mobile first app. So you can trade on Kraken wherever you are. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin. Find out more at Kraken.com or download the app. It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. And finally, we're going to end out this week with my friends over at BlockFi, the future of Bitcoin and financial services. Love these guys. They've been with me. It's coming up to a year and a half now. Maybe it's been a year and a half. It's been so long. I couldn't have done this without the guys. Love you, Zach. Love you, Flory. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And what a way to kick off 2020. They announced they are launching a BTC rewards card where you can earn sats back, cash back on your spends. I cannot wait for this. I cannot put into words how much I'm looking forward to this. As soon as I see Zach, I'm going to be twisting his arm saying, get me my card, get me my fucking card. I want my card. Also, they've got a mobile app coming, which is going to be sweet. This is on top of their already market-leading crypto back loans and their interest accounts where you can earn interest on your Bitcoin, Ether, and GUSD. 2020 is going to be massive for BlockFi. So if you're thinking about being a customer, do your own research, then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Okay, so now we're going to move on to securities, and I've visited the SEC a couple of times, and uh, I've done a couple of interviews there, and th this is a very interesting area, and the reason this one is kind of interesting, because I think this is going to separate Bitcoin, the grey possibility of Ethereum, and a lot of other crypto-based projects ex existed. So a very good area of starting for this is, just for people who don't know, let's explain what a security is, and then let's define what the the measure of what a security is which is i know is the howey test let's go through that so people understand and also you should probably add in there why it's important to classify something as a security or not sure so to go back to our original um layout uh investor protection consumer protection the different areas securities regulation is about investor protection and a security classically you know the normal run-of-the-mill security that you'd find is generally going to be a bond or a share of stock. You know, those are, those are what we normally think of as securities. So like a share of Apple stock that you buy using uh, Robinhood or some app on your phone or talking to your broker, that's what we normally think of as securities. And so the question might be, well, that's very different than Bitcoin because that's, that's either a debt obligation or an equity obligation that a corporation owes its investor. It's like you get 
5% of this company, or you get a regular $2,000 payment from us because you gave us money and we owe you. It's a debt obligation. So that seems very different than Bitcoin, where when you own a Bitcoin, you don't have a claim against Bitcoin Corporation. There is no Bitcoin Corporation that owes you the value of the Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin Corporation that owes you a share of its total net worth. There's no Bitcoin Corporation, period. So the question might be, okay, well, why is securities law relevant here? Because Bitcoin's obviously not a traditional debt instrument or bond or stock or thing like that. And the answer is what you were saying, Peter. The definition of a security is a little bit broader than just you know, a bond or a stock. The definition in the U.S. especially is broad enough that it might reach some other things beyond just stocks and bonds. And that definition comes from the, the, the court case called the W.J. Howey versus the, the U.S., which was a court case where somebody was selling some real estate in Florida. And that looks like a real estate transaction, but they were also promising to maintain the land and grow the oranges on the real estate that you are buying and give you a share of the profits from the orange grove. So you're not just buying the land, you're buying this this stream sort of revenue. stream of revenue from the guy who's maintaining the oranges on the land. And the SEC said, that's not just a real estate purchase, that's actually kind of like having a share of ownership in an orange grove. And so we're going to regulate that like it was a stock, because it's kind of like having stock in an orange company or an orange grove, but it's different. And the test they came up with in the, U- in the Supreme Court case that that said, yes, the SEC can regulate that kind of financial instrument, is called the Howey test today. And the test asks, it says, you're going to be subject to securities regulation if, if what you're selling or advertising or promoting is something where an investment of money is made in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits dependent on the efforts of a third-party promoter. And that's a, that's a three- or four-prong test, depending on how you count the clauses in that sentence. And they're all pretty important. You know, it's true that when we buy Bitcoin, we invest money. So it's obvious that even just a Bitcoin sale involves an investment of money. Maybe you're mining it, but even then you're investing in a, in a certain sense because you're investing in computer hardware to get the Bitcoins when you mine. Now, in a common enterprise was the next part of that test. And the question is, is Bitcoin a common enterprise? And the answer, we think, is no. Not in the same way that Howie with his land full of oranges was a common enterprise. You know, everyone goes to Howie to ask for their profits from the orange grove. Because as I was saying earlier, there's no Bitcoin corporation where you can go to and say, hey, I want the value of my Bitcoin. That's not how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is more like a commodity. It's more like the oranges themselves than the person who owes you the money from the oranges. You can just own it outright and trade it. The third prong was an expectation of profits. So you're investing your money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits. Do people expect profits when they buy Bitcoin? Yes, probably. Maybe, maybe. You know, But a lot of people think of it as a payment instrument where you don't necessarily think of uh, profits as much or as a store of value where you just sort of hope for a steady uh, long-term price. But I think it's right that a lot of people do expect profits. But that's okay if there's no common enterprise. You can meet some of the answers to this test, like yes, there was an investment of money, and yes, there's an expectation of profits, and fail others, like common enterprise, and it's not a security. To be a security, you have to meet all the elements of this test. And then the last prong there is the profits come from the efforts of others. And this is, again, where Bitcoin seems to fail the test. Because, you know, what controls the price of Bitcoin? It's really just open markets where people are deciding independently to either buy or sell. And the amount of Bitcoin, which is the other input to the economic calculus, so the the buying and selling decisions is the demand on an economic graph, and the supply is the other input to determine the price, that input is set by the protocol and is not in control of any person or affiliated group of persons. There's always going to be 21 million Bitcoins. So where is this mythical person whose efforts we're relying on for the price? They don't exist. Hence why Bitcoin seems to fail two of the four prongs of the Howey test, common enterprise and efforts of others. Now, you suggested that this might be a place where we see differentiation between Bitcoin and the other altcoins uh, and the other blockchain projects out there. And you're absolutely right. 
And so the reason why the SEC is particularly interested in this broader area, if, if not Bitcoin in particular, is because some people have copied the original source code of Bitcoin, decided to launch their own altcoin or alternative cryptocurrency, and then they've sold them to the public or a promise of them to the public before the network's even running. And we call that a pre-sale or an ICO or any number of other bad marketing terms. And in that context, now run that. So, you know, we'll call it S-Coin, which may or may not stand for shit. S-Coin is going to be sold to the general public, but the network's not going to launch for another year or two, right? At that point, yeah, people are investing their money in a common enterprise because there's S-Coin Corp that's promising to build S-Coin in two years. With an expectation of profits, most of these things are marketed as great ways to like double or triple your money. So that prong's going to work. And then reliance on efforts of a third party. Again, there's an S-Coin Corp who in two years may or may not deliver on their promise to build a new cryptocurrency. And maybe once they do deliver, it's a fully decentralized cryptocurrency where there isn't reliance on the efforts of others. But up until the point where they do deliver... You, you bet you're reliant on them because we're still waiting for them to deliver the thing they promised. So those kinds of pre-sales and ICO agreements are usually going to be regulated as securities, whereas Bitcoin and a running network is not going to be regulated as a security. And just to now put this in context, why are we even talking about this? It matters whether you're regulated as a security or not. It matters for a couple of reasons. The promoter would need to register with the SEC. They can't just start selling it or promoting it without checking in with the SEC and effectively getting permission. And if it's a security, it can only trade on national securities exchanges, which means you won't be able to have your coin traded on Coinbase. It'll have to trade on the New York Stock Exchange, which may or may not be all that ready to list your particular S coin. And I'll say one more thing since you mentioned Ethereum. There's a question around Ethereum and, and what its security status. And I think that you see SEC and now even the CFTC has been very clear that Ethereum is not a, secu- it's not a security. And I think that's the right conclusion because, as you know, Peter was saying, if you run that Howey test on Ethereum, it's the same as running it on Bitcoin. You have this decentralized network. You're not relying on anybody in particular, et cetera, et cetera. Now, notice that the, when the SEC made that statement, they said nothing about the Ethereum presale, right? So you need to separate out when in this analysis. When Peter was talking about S-Coin, you have the S-Coin offering, which Peter was saying clearly a security, and then you have S-Coin itself. If it ever you know, is launched and it's running and it's decentralized, S-Coin is not a security, but the offering certainly was. So – Can you give me an example of something that has turned out to be a security, how the SEC has reacted and the uh, sanctions they've put on the people who run that security? I mean, you don't have to name the coin if you don't want to, but just a good example of of what the risks are for people who might end up creating a security via a cryptocurrency. So what's interesting is, since this is all very new, um, and we've only seen the SEC begin with enforcement action starting in what, 2018? We really don't have these yet, right? We've had settlements, right? And so when you have the SEC basically uh, allege that you've issued a security and the person settles out of court, they typically accept a fine. They might uh, have to return the funds to investors. They might promise not to engage in that kind of business again, et cetera. But what we have not had and we're looking forward to are court decisions, right? Because so far, it's it's just a theory, right? The SEC says, if you do these things um, that meet the Howey test, then you're a security. But ultimately, for that to be law, a court has to say so. We haven't had that those precedents yet. Um, right now, there are two cases. Um, you have Kik and you have Telegram, where the SEC is having to go to court and try to prove that these things are uh, securities. And that's going to turn a lot on what the facts in those cases are. Yeah, basically looking at the facts of KIC or the facts of Telegram and comparing them to the legal questions inherent in the Howey test, investment of money, common enterprise, all that. On the settlement side, which as Jerry said is how most of the things have have gone so far, the two things to look at are probably the SIA note 
or SIA, I'm not entirely, SIA, SIA coin settlement and the recent Block One or EOS settlement. So both of those were projects where somebody raised money to build a decentralized cryptocurrency or altcoin. And in both those cases, the SEC struck the exact balance that Jerry was talking about earlier, saying, look, when you pre-sold a promise of future profits from your network that you were promising to build, that was a security. But the, the decentralized token either EOS in the case of Block One or SIA Coin in the case of the SIA Note Settlement, those are not securities. Now, the SEC didn't come out and say that those derivative innovations and technologies were not securities, but the yes. fact that they settled with them and said, we're only fining you for the pre-sale is pretty good evidence that this is how the SEC sees this right now, and we think um, is definitely the right policy balance to strike. When, when you're asking for people to just hand you money to build something that's speculative, you should probably follow the same rules that other people selling securities follow. But once you've built it and you're not actually in control of it and people aren't relying on you anymore for its functionality and for its value, then it shouldn't be a security. Okay, so the biggest risk here is for somebody who's listened to this show might be thinking of creating some kind of cryptocurrency project that could end up becoming or being classed as a security. Now, I would put out there, I don't recommend creating any cryptocurrency project because they all are pretty much doomed to failure. And, you know, as I've covered in my show with Nick Carter that's coming out next week, altcoins are essentially a history of failure. But if you choose to go down that route, that's the risk you're taking. But Uh, Peter, can I say one thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on that subject, I think even if you do want to build your own cryptocurrency, you know, follow the the beautiful example of Satoshi Nakamoto and don't do a pre-mine and don't do a pre-sale or an ICO. You know, just write cool software that you think people will want to use as a network. And if they want to use it, they'll use it. And at no point, and you will benefit if people use it. But at no point are you asking people to give you a bunch of money to trust you on your better cryptocurrency idea, because as you said, most cryptocurrency ideas since Bitcoin have been a little bit disappointing. Uh, Well, I'd say a little bit. Majority, very disappointing. Some moderately (laughs) disappointing. Most, very disappointing. But just to close this one out, I've got two final questions. The first one is, if someone has listened to this beginner's guide, they've gone through it all, and despite me telling them to focus on Bitcoin, to not trade, you know, just to consider this as their investment, but they still end up deciding they want to invest in other cryptocurrencies, and for some reason they invest in an ICO, and it turns out to be a security, are there any implications on them as a retail buyer of that ICO? No, except because the secondary markets will have to be securities exchanges if it's a security, at least in the U.S. Um, the depth of the market where someone can go back to sell the thing from to somebody else if they want to get rid of it might be shallow because you won't have access to Coinbase or the other major cryptocurrency exchanges to sell it. You'll have to sell it on a national securities exchange, which probably won't list it, in which case you'll probably have to sell it on an international market if you want to sell it. But there's, there's no legal liability that I'm aware of for the user in that case you're the victim yeah somebody owes you money (laughs) all right so let's get into the kyc aml this is the thing that's probably going to touch people most of all especially if you're a bitcoiner kyc aml might be something that you're like what the hell is this and you might not even realize you're actually engaged with the kyc aml process you know when you first get into this but you know kyc is know your customer aml is anti-money laundering you know it's very, very much something that's directed by the U.S., but, you know, is highly relevant around the world. Can you talk about what they are and why the government deems this important? Sure. So first, a little preface about the U.S. versus international law, because I think this is an area where we can be very helpful to people beyond the U.S. The U.S. standards for anti-money laundering and, and know your customer laws are in the Bank Secrecy Act, which is a particular act of Congress. And in the implementing regulations, that the relative, the, the relevant agency, FinCEN, has promulgated. And so I'm going to talk about those regulations, but let's point out first that the U.S. was recently the president of an international body called the, the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF. And as president of the FATF for the last cycle, which is, I think, like uh, it's, a year, I think. it's a year or two, the U.S. promulgated new international standards about 
AML KYC regulation for cryptocurrencies. And FATF made those standards official in Recommendation 15 and a few other pieces of guidance. So we exported our policy through the FATF to this international body. And this international body has members in all of Europe. All of the European nations are members of FATF, all of Africa, all of Asia, all of South America. So those member nations will now need, it's called Recommendation 15. You know, it's called the FATF Recommendations. But effectively, they're not really optional. Nations around the world now are going to have to implement the same anti-money laundering laws that we have in the U.S. And that's, that's just how it's worked out. Now, that might sound scary, but at least here at Coin Center, we're here to tell you that it's not such bad news if you're really just a normal user of Bitcoin. And the reason is because the U.S. policy on anti-money laundering has been not so bad. Uh, it's struck the right balance. And so here's that policy that's now going to be exported to the rest of the world. And let me just say one thing before you explain that. You also have to think about when you think about was this good or bad is to consider the alternative. And the current president of the FATF, which took over after the U.S. was done, is China. Um, and so query what sort of virtual currency AML regime would they have implemented had the U.S. not yeah. hurried up and done it. If China had gotten the first stab at regulating virtual currencies for AML, we might not have had such a rosy outcome. So the U.S. policy compromise on anti-money laundering is this. You are regulated from an anti-money laundering, know-your-customer perspective if you are, again, a money transmitter. And the U.S. definition of who is a money transmitter, in Europe we often use the word virtual asset service provider or VASP, so these are, the, these are similar things, is somebody who accepts and transmits currency or currency substitutes. And Bitcoin is almost certainly a currency substitute. It's something people use as a substitute for currency. And so the question is, it, you are regulated for AML if you accept and transmit Bitcoin as a customer business. So that's, in a nutshell, what, say, Coinbase does. You know, they will accept Bitcoin from their customers and transmit their customers' Bitcoin to other people. It's custody. It's just like our discussion earlier about custodians being regulated for money transmission licensing. Now, there's some questions on the edges. Is somebody who's just holding their own Bitcoin a money transmitter? They accept Bitcoin from people paying them, and they might transmit it to people they want to pay, but they're not doing it as a business. They're just receiving Bitcoin from someone who wants to pay them or sending or paying someone with Bitcoin. So they're not a money transmitter any, any more than someone who decides to pay somebody with a $20 bill or receive a $20 bill from someone as a money transmitter. And FinCEN clarified exactly which kinds of Bitcoin businesses are money transmitters in the guidance they released in May 2019. And they went so far as to even say that people who set up, say, decentralized exchanges, where you could do an atomic swap of a Bitcoin for an Ethereum, for example, on a cross-chain swap, if they don't, as a business, accept and transmit the currency substitute being traded by the platform, if it's just individual users settling outside of the platform, they're not money transmitters. And this kind of ruling goes so far as to say that, say, if you had a multi-sig agreement where you are uh, offering a multi-sig wallet product to your users, and you're going to hold one key of three in the Bitcoin multi-sig arrangement on behalf of your user, but your user has the other two keys, um, something like what BitGo might do as a multi-sig provider, you're not a money transmitter. Because Simply holding one key out of three in a multi-sig arrangement is not accepting anything from your customer or transmitting anything on their behalf. It's just holding one key. You can't unilaterally or independently move the Bitcoin that your customers help, you're helping your customer store. So this particular May 2019 FinCEN guidance was very clear about things like multi-sig, decentralized exchange, and individual users that Unless you're really operating as a business that holds other people's Bitcoin for them, like a Coinbase or a Kraken, you are not regulated for anti-money laundering purposes. Now, that means that if you are a Coinbase or a Kraken, or if you're somebody who wants to start a Bitcoin business that will help people hold their own Bitcoin or hold their Bitcoin, so you're going to hold their Bitcoin for them, 
you will be regulated for AML, which means you need to monitor for suspicious activities. You need to file reports with FinCEN when somebody like withdraws a whole bunch of Bitcoin from you, maybe. And you need to know all the people who keep their Bitcoin with you. You need to know their name. You need to know their address. You may want to know their social security number and other things. So that's what anti-money laundering regulation is. You need to effectively know a lot of information about your customers and give that information to the regulator. But that, again, does not apply to somebody just using Bitcoin. And that's important because if it did, you'd be basically asking people to spy on other people, to learn information about who they're paying or who they're getting paid by and report that to the government, which would have Fourth Amendment constitutional concerns about our rights to privacy, for example. But we don't need to make those constitutional arguments because FinCEN... Coin Center believes has made really good choices as to limiting the set of entities that are actually regulated as anti-money laundering or know your customer obligated entities. Right. Okay. So firstly, I'm just going to say, if you're listening in and you're wondering what an atomic swap is, then don't worry. You don't have to worry just now. <laughs> if you're wondering what a multi-sig wallet is, don't worry. We're going to cover that in the future. But these are all very important points that Peter is making. But I think the key separation here is, and the, the, the basics that someone needs to understand, that is if you're running a business and you are, buying, and you are giving people the opportunity to buy and sell Bitcoin, there are also onerous uh, requirements that you have to follow with regards to your customers. And I think more with regards to the customer, if you're signing up to a website and you're buying and selling Bitcoin, you're most likely going to have to give identification over, which links you to that purchase. That's right. And then two things quickly about where AML KYC type laws definitely will apply to you as an individual and you should watch out. The first is, as we were saying earlier, if you're going on local Bitcoins and advertising your services as someone who will buy a lot of Bitcoin from somebody who wants to sell a lot of Bitcoin or sell a lot of Bitcoin to people who want to buy some, and you're doing that regularly in order to make a profit, you might be regulated as as a, a Bitcoin exchange, effectively, as somebody who needs to do know your customer and anti-money laundering controls because you're operating as a business that helps people get onto the Bitcoin protocol. So if you're selling or buying a lot on local Bitcoins and advertising your services, like, hey, you need Bitcoin? I'll give you some Bitcoin. You probably need to know your customers. You probably need to register with FinCEN. The other area where this matters is in the context of sanctions law. So this is not the same AML KYC laws as what I was talking about with FinCEN. This is something called OFAC here in the U.S., the Office of Foreign Asset Control. OFAC is the division of treasury that enforces U.S. sanctions. U.S. sanctions are things like don't do business with people in Iran, don't do business with people in North Korea. OFAC applies to all American citizens. It doesn't apply to just businesses. It also applies to American citizens. So if you start paying someone in Iran and you know that they're in Iran, or maybe you don't even know that they're in Iran, you're technically in violation of sanctions law. And that doesn't matter if you pay them in Bitcoin or in dollars. And OFAC, the office that will enforce these sanction laws against people who violate them, has recently started listing Bitcoin addresses as sanctioned because they've identified them maybe as the Bitcoin addresses used by a terrorist or used by someone in Iran or North Korea. And so, you know, if you really want to be um, diligent, and you're afraid that this person I'm paying, I don't know anything about them, and it's kind of sketchy, you could check the address they want to receive payment out uh, against the OFAC list. Because technically, if you do end up sending to one of those OFAC-sanctioned addresses, you would be in violation of sanctions law, which can have very strict penalties. All right, so the last area here we're going to cover is tax. And this is the area I think that's most important to retail users, the thing they need to consider most, and is probably the area that you know people need to do most research in their local jurisdiction. So I know there's a difference between from, from country to country. I know, for example, in the UK, it's considered a capital gains tax. I know, for example, in Germany, they have specific tax laws where if, I think if you don't spend it for a certain period of time, it's tax-free. I know it, it differs from country to country. So more than anything else we've discussed in this session, you really, really should be checking you know, your local laws in your local jurisdiction. But just for the sake of this, there's a couple of key questions that we can ask. So 
Firstly, you can obviously explain what the tax laws just briefly are in the US. I mean, 50% of my listeners are from there, so they'll probably benefit from that. But the most interesting question here, and I think this affects everyone, is why is taxation of Bitcoin so complicated? So just to explain briefly what the tax laws are, as you're saying, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In Germany, it depends. Sometimes it's a currency. In the US and the UK, it's capital gains. In South Korea, there's no tax. In Australia, I think there's a VAT tax on the purchase of Bitcoin, which makes it you know, kind of a very difficult to use. So it's, it's very different. Why is it so complicated? It's so complicated because it's this new asset that is not quite a payment system, not quite clearly a commodity like gold, but it's used in, in all of these ways. And I think also because the regulators haven't yet decided how to treat it. Because it's kind of a currency and kind of an investment asset like gold, the question of how it fits into capital gains tax is hard because normally you pay capital gains when you sell a big investment and you only do that once or twice every year. But if you're always you know, using Bitcoin to buy and sell goods because you're using it as a currency, you might end up with a whole bunch of independent taxable moments where you have to pay capital gains tax. And Jerry's going to talk about how we're trying to improve that situation here in the U.S. in a second. The other area where it's complicated is that these are open protocols that can fork. And both the software forks, but the blockchain can fork sometimes too, as we saw when Bitcoin Cash forked out of Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin SV forked out of Bitcoin Cash. Now, the issue there is if it's one of these blockchain forks, you know, before the fork, you had five Bitcoin at address X. After the fork, you have five Bitcoin at address X. You also have five Bitcoin Cash at address X on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And if you wanted to, you could use your same private key to sell your Bitcoin Cash now because maybe you believe that Bitcoin's the real Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash is just silly. You might believe that. When you go to sell your Bitcoin Cash, what was your basis? Um, when, you, when, you, when you have capital gains tax, you say, I bought this share of Apple stock at 5, and now it's 10, so my basis is 5, so I owe 20% of the gain, which is $5. Well, what's your basis with Bitcoin Cash? You bought the Bitcoin at some price before there was a fork, and then there was a fork, and you have this new thing. How do you figure out how much your capital gains was? Bitcoin's price has changed since you bought it, and Bitcoin Cash didn't even exist, but now it has changed. Maybe your basis is zero. Maybe your basis is a split of the value of Bitcoin when it forked. These are open questions, and they're very difficult to answer. And it's even possible that when the fork happened, the new Bitcoin Cash that you got out of thin air, effectively, was income, not even capital gains. It's like somebody gave you a valuable gift or a not-so-valuable gift, depending on what the price of Bitcoin Cash is and how you feel about it. And if it's income, then maybe you had a taxable moment simply because somebody decided to fork Bitcoin. And maybe you don't even know that Bitcoin forked. But because somebody else forked it and you don't even know, you technically might have had income in that moment because you had the private key, which might have allowed you to spend that Bitcoin. So this gets very complicated very quickly, as you you can understand. And we've been working with the IRS to, to hopefully make it not so bad and not so complicated. Just a fun other example of of how forks create this kind of complication. Take Ethereum. I think, you know, when Ethereum forked and you had Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, um, I think a lot of folks probably did the, you know, try to do everything um, by the book. And they filed, um, uh, you know, they sold, let's say they they kept their Ethereum, they sold all their Ethereum Classic, and they um, filed their taxes for, you know, for capital gains and paid capital gains. But now when you look at the IRS guidance, it's not so clear th- which was the forked coin because I think just colloquially people think, well, Ethereum Classic is the fork of Ethereum. But wait a minute, Ethereum Classic is the one that never changed. So Ethereum might be the forked asset. Yeah. And so you did your taxes wrong. It's very, very complicated. Well, I will say if anyone came into this 
struggling and thinking, God, some of this Bitcoin stuff's complicated. Without without <laughs> doubt, this is the this is the one session they're gonna be like, what the hell? But like we I think we can keep this simple, right? I think if we were to kind of summarize, look, if you're just a regular new user to Bitcoin, you're just buying it for your first time, you know, the thing you really need to think about, like where you're buying it, you might be given information over for your KYC and AML, and you should really check your local taxes. The people who need to really get in detail and understand about all of this stuff in terms of payments, security, KYC, AML, you know, and tax in a different way, uh, is anyone who's getting anything, I want to create a company. I'm going to create a business that's involved in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. They're the people who have to spend a little more time. But the main issue for retail users, as I would say, is the, the primary thing is their tax. I think that's right. And I think if you are buying and holding, what you want to make sure is that you're keeping very accurate records of what you're buying and when and at what price. So that the day that you sell, you can ha have an accountant help you comply with whatever tax law is in your jurisdiction. And maybe if you hold on long enough, that'll be certain and clear. And you know what? I will include a bunch of notes in the show notes so people can follow this, they can find out more information. I think a, a kind of interesting way to close this out, though, is, is let's take this back to Coin Center. You know, this is a very complicated area. What are the things that you, you know, as an organization are pushing for? Where do you want to see changes? Where do you think this will could all get a little bit easier? So a lot of the work that we do is, you might, you might say, defensive in nature or educational in nature. So there are some very bad ideas that oftentimes float up and we have to um, go in and sort of explain how things, you know, how the technology actually works and how these ideas might not be the best fit. A good example of that recently was in response to the government's reaction to, to Libra. There were any number of legislative proposals that would have regulated not just the kind of stablecoin that Libra would be, but all stablecoins. And indeed, in some of these bills, the way that stablecoin was defined, it could have included Bitcoin, which is crazy. But that's the way it is. So a lot of what we do is kind of defensive that way. On a proactive um, kind of note, I think at this point we're very happy with, you know, generally with the regulatory settlement that we've reached in the U.S. We think tax is the one notable notable area where uh, we need more clarity. And so, for example, you know, an example of something there is uh, trying to get a exemption from capital gains for small Bitcoin and cryptocurrency transactions. So again, if you are buying, let's say, $1,000 of Bitcoin a month because you want to hold and you know, then you sell after a few years, clearly you did it as an investment and you're going to have to pay capital gains on whatever um, uh, gains you've made. But if you are buying Bitcoin because you want to tip Niraj or you want to, quite frankly, maybe um, notarize some documents on the Bitcoin blockchain or something like that, those are small personal transactions that should be exempted from capital gains. Because if they're not, that means you owe capital gains on every time you use the Bitcoin blockchain. And that you know, creates basically a law that you know, nobody could possibly comply with. And so we've worked with Representative uh, Schweiker and Representative Delbene and Representative Elm Emmer uh, in Congress to introduce a bill that would create a exemption from capital gains for cryptocurrency the same way that one exists for foreign currency. Okay, great. The only thing I'd add, since we have your platform, Peter, is that Coin Center is a nonprofit. We rely on donations from people who <laughs> like the work we do in order to operate. And even if you think a lot of the sort of more loyally egghead stuff that we've described so far isn't that important, again, what Jerry said is right. Most of what we do is defensive. So it's two-pronged. We spend time building relationships with members of Congress and their staff so that there'll be a few members of Congress who understand the technology and believe in it. When the day comes where something terrible happens and people start calling for a ban on the protocol or a ban on people's use of the protocol, you need rational people to stand up and say, look, just like we can't ban encryption, we can't ban Bitcoin. And we help cultivate those relationships. And then the other is I write a number of pretty dense legal reports about things like the constitutional law of free speech and privacy in the U.S. 
and why on any attempt to ban Bitcoin or use of the protocol might be unconstitutional because it would stop people's you know, exercise of their free speech rights or their privacy rights. So if you think that work's important, which Jerry and I, of course, sort of dedicate our lives to, please think about supporting Coin Center uh, and don't hesitate to reach out to us. Yeah, I will echo that. I mean, firstly, if you guys didn't exist doing what you were doing, well, firstly, we wouldn't be doing this interview. But if I was doing this interview with somebody else, uh, undoubtedly the things we would be discussing would be even more complicated because you've helped and guided some of the regula- the regulations that exist, right? You, you've been deeply involved. And almost certainly you're going to make this, uh, you say it's defensive, but almost certainly you're going to make this all easier for us in the future. So absolutely, if you are a, if you look, listen, if somebody's listened to this and you're a long-term Bitcoiner, you should be supporting Coin Center. But if you're new and you've just get it in, you know, down the line, just remember these guys exist. Remember the work they're doing. Also, go back and check out my other interviews with Peter. There's two previously that are worth listening to. And I will have Jerry on at some point. We will do our own one. We're going to go a little bit cypherpunk and a little bit radical and anarchist at some point. <laughs> all right, so listen, if people do want to find out more, how do they find out? Where do they go to? So we put all of our public advocacy materials on coincenter.org, uh, and you can also donate there if you'd like. Awesome. Well, listen, thanks, guys, for coming on. This was awesome. It's definitely going to be a little bit complicated for some people, but I think we summarized it up nicely. So appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Peter. All right. So what did you make of that? Did that fly over your head? Honestly, don't worry. Some of this still flies over my head. The most important things to be aware of as a hodler of Bitcoin, someone new coming in, someone who's maybe bored a little bit, is that you need to consider your local tax laws. And be aware that if you are buying Bitcoin on an exchange, you will be handing over personal information. Everything else we discovered, it pretty much always relates to business. So unless you're now just thinking about starting up some kind of Bitcoin-based business, a wallet, or an exchange, then you don't need to worry about most of this. But still, if you do want to find out more, look, you can go on the CoinCenter website, check out some of their stuff. I've added links to that in the show notes. That should help you. And I do want to say a big thanks to Peter and Jerry for coming out and doing this and also to Niraj for helping me schedule this. On Friday, I've got another great show coming up. I've got Nick Carter and we're going to be looking into the history of altcoins. That's a smashing show. Anyway, before we close out, I want to say thank you to everyone who supports the show. Whoever you are, whatever you do, big love to you from me. If you are a regular listener, if you do want to support the show, please head over to my website. It's whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. It will tell you everything. Any questions about the show, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. 